Hello and welcome to Doc Clay's Chemistry Lessons. Today we're going to be looking at AQA A-level chemistry and we're going to be looking at the topic of carboxylic acids and esters. By the end of this lesson then we should be able to do the following. We should be able to apply our IUPAC rules for naming carboxylic acids and esters. Describe the reactions of carboxylic acids with carbonates. Recall and give the reaction conditions for esterification reactions and describe hydrolysis reactions and the two reactions of saponification and the formation of biodiesel. Carboxylic acids then are from our original carboxyl group that we've seen before in our previous lectures but this time we're looking at our functional group changing here the X group we have our R with a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and our carboxylic acid has an OH group and this gives us our carboxylic acid that can be identified by this end functional group. Just so we're aware this is sometimes written in the structural formula as COOH and then some people describe it as a CO group and as well, if we're drawing it as a skeletal formula, we have here a two carbon chain with a carbon double bonded oxygen. The naming of the carboxylic acids then is done by using the suffix oic acid. And we can look at an example here by looking at this molecule that we've got. In terms of numbering our carbon, we start with the carbon, which is part of the carboxylic acid. So we have one, two, three, four carbons. So this is a molecule which is based on butane. We have the extension oic acid describing the carboxylic acid group and then we've got two side groups to add. In this case we're going to label these by alphabetical order so this is a hydroxy group while this is a methyl so the, the ones to come first is a hydroxyl so we're one two three four so it's four dash hydroxy 1, 2, methyl butanoic acid. If you want to recap some of the IUPAC naming conventions, then just check on this video link that's just come up in the corner of this screen. Carboxylic acids, then, are weak acids, and this is because they will lose one of their hydrogen ions and that will dissociate and partially dissociate when dissolved in water. When this happens you form the carboxylate ion and you also form a hydrogen ion or a proton. The negative charge here is actually distributed around the carbon and the two oxygens which is why it's stable. The equilibrium here usually lies fairly heavily to the left hand side with a small amount of the carboxylate ion and the proton forming when dissolved in water. Since carboxylic acids are by nature acidic it means that they are able to react with bases and also with carbonates. This gives partially a test for carboxylic acids because if we react them with a carbonate we should observe the formation of carbon dioxide. In this example what we'll see is we've got ethanoic acid, the two carbon chain carboxylic acid, reacting with sodium carbonate and that reacts to form the salt of the acid which is here 
and water and carbon dioxide. So the observation you would see if you were doing this reaction is you would observe fizzing or effervescence. The salt of the acid is taken from the carboxylate group. So the naming convention for the carboxylate group is to call it or is to give it the suffix O8. And in this case, we've got a two carbon chain. So this is ethan O8. The O8 indicating that it is the carboxylate ion. And this is stabilized here by the sodium ion. So this is in fact sodium ethan O8. A second example here then, we've got a single carbon chain, or this is methan oic acid. And here we've got instead of just sodium carbonate, we've now got an extra hydrogen in here. So this is now sodium hydrogen carbonate. And once again, these would react to get carbon dioxide, so we observe fizzing, water, and the salt of the acid. This time, again, we've got a carboxylate ion, so it's an O8 extension, and it's got one carbon in the chain, so it's methan O8. The stabilizing ion here is sodium. Often, You'll also see stabilizing ions such as potassium used as well. Get used to the naming convention here of the O8 because this will be seen a lot when you come and look at acids and bases and buffer solutions. We're now going to look at some of the reactions then of carboxylic acids. If we take then a carboxylic acid and we heat that along with a acid catalyst under reflux conditions along with an alcohol then what happens is the OH group from the carboxylic acid comes away and it reacts with the hydrogen on the alcohol group and a bond is formed between the oxygen of the alcohol and the carbon group. Delete those lines. And what we form then is a bond between the new bond between the carbon and the oxygen, and we have water as well. We've got a new functional group where we've got a carbon double bonded to an oxygen to an R group, a methyl group. And this functional group here is called an ester. We'll look at naming those in just a minute. Importantly, the new bond then is here between the carbon and the oxygen. So the conditions for this esterification reaction tend to be either concentrated H2SO4, so that's sulfuric acid, or concentrated phosphoric acid, which is H3PO4. And again, this is done under heat and reflux in order for a reaction to occur. So we're going to go and look at naming esters. And an ester is named in two parts. The suffix part of the ester always comes from the carbon, which has got the double bonded oxygen. And that describes the number of carbons in that chain. The first part is always from the carbon bonded to the single oxygen. And that is an alkyl group in this case. 
and it's got one carbon. So this becomes methyl. And then the functional group, which is the second part, has got two carbons, and it's a bit like our carboxylate iron, because we call this methyl ethanoate. And so it's named like our carboxylate iron, because if we were to look at the molecule with the methyl group on this side removed, then we have a carboxylate iron like we did with our carboxylic acids, but instead of a sodium group, we got a methyl group there. So this is methyl ethanoate. We'll have a look at a couple more examples just to help us. Here then we've got three slightly more complex examples which we'll have a go at naming. We'll follow our same idea and if we look at this first one, well we've got the carbon double bonded oxygen. So this is our O8 part, so this is based on a one carbon methanoate. And that's our second part of the naming. And then we've got a one, two, three carbon chain attached to the carbon uh, to the oxygen with a methyl at the first carbon. So this is one methyl propyl methanoate. Let's look at our second example then. This time we've got a relatively easy extension here, but if we look on our ester functional group, we've got a methyl group which is coming off. So this one's looking a little bit confusing. So let's go back to our naming convention again. Here's our ester section. So we've got one, two, three, four carbons. So this is going to be based on butanoate. And we can see here that we have a methyl group on our second carbon, because we named from the carbon next to the carbon double bond oxygen. So this is going to be 2-methylbutanoate. And then we're going to deal with our first part, which is a two carbon chain. So this is ethyl space 2-methylbutanoate. The final example then is dealing with a group that we've not come across yet, but we will do soon. So this is a benzene group, and this is our carbon double bond oxygen. So this is where our ester is. So this is benz O8 and the carbon attached to the single bond oxygen is therefore methyl space benzo8. So in this final section we're going to look at esters, their uses and their reactions and we'll start off with uses. So you'll probably come across the esters in the laboratory and you'll find they have sweet smells and therefore are often used in flavorings. The classic one that we often make in the lab is the one where we make pear drop smell. They're also polar liquids and therefore can be used as solvents and therefore used in a variety of other uh, organic compound reactions. So often used here is solvents and the final thing, they are used as plasticizers in polymers. A plasticizer will make a polymer more flexible. And the only issue with it is that over time, the plasticizer leaks out and therefore your polymer becomes brittle. The of esters then is dominated by the hydrolysis of the esters which is essentially the reverse process that we saw before of the esterification reaction. So the hydrolysis is the breaking of the carbon-oxygen bond that we saw. And there's two ways of doing a hydrolysis reaction, which we'll see. 
Hydrolysis then means to add water or to break up by adding of water. And our first example here is the acid catalyzed hydrolysis. And in this reaction, we are again heating with reflux, but this time we're going to be using dilute H2SO4 to do the reaction rather than concentrated sulfuric acid when we went in the other direction. And it can also be done with hydro dilute hydrochloric acid as well. In this process, the carbon double bond oxygen and single bond oxygen bond there is broken by the water and we reform carboxylic acid and the alcohol. This is, as I said, the reverse of our esterification and the carbon single bond oxygen is broken and the alcohol forms from the single bond oxygen side and the carboxylic acid is from, from the double bond oxygen side. The other example of the hydrolysis, the base catalyzed reaction. And in this reaction, we are refluxing with heat, but this time we'll be using a base such as dilute sodium hydroxide in aqueous conditions. And again, we break the carbon single bond oxygen and we form the alcohol. But this time, because we're using a base, we form the salt of the acid and therefore we form the carboxylate ion. And often what we'll form in this reaction is we'll actually form the salt, often the sodium salt, or the potassium salt, depending on whether we've used sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide to do the base catalyzed hydrolysis. In a moment, we're going to go and look at two key reactions which use these hydrolysis reactions. So animal fats and vegetable oils are an ester that is formed from the glycerol chain which is here, and we'll see in a moment, and then a carbon backbone of fatty acids. These fatty acids then will either be saturated or unsaturated. If we get unsaturated fatty acids, then the carbon chains are unable to align themselves so well because the carbon-carbon double bond fixes them in a position and they have a lower melting point because they have weaker intermolecular forces. These unsaturated carbon chains therefore form oils and tend to be in vegetable oils. On the other hand, if the carbon chain is saturated, then the long fatty acid chains are more easily aligned and therefore have stronger intermolecular forces giving them higher melting points and therefore tend to be more solid and form those things such as animal fats. It's possible then to hydrolyze these fats in one of two ways. We can first of all look at the base hydrolysis of these fats and here we've got our example of our fat or oil and we're reacting that here with our sodium hydroxide and we break the ester link that we have here and we form our well there's two ways of naming it we can call this glycerol which is one way of doing it or you can call it one, sorry, propane, propan, one, two, three, trial. The other product we have here, well, this is the salt of our ester, and this is the sodium salt, which forms a, a semi solid compound and is otherwise known as soap. 
which is indeed the stuff that you wash yourself with. As a result, this is also sometimes called a saponification reaction as it forms the soap as one of the products. So if we add sodium hydroxide, we hydrolyze our side, we hydrolyze the fat to form soap plus a glycerol or triol. If, however, we do the hydrolysis of the fat or oil with a catalyst of potassium hydroxide, and instead of just using sodium hydroxide, we also add in some methanol. Well, we break the ester link once again, as we've seen before. Once again, we form the glycerol or propan one, two, three, triol. And this time we end up with a series of methyl esters. And these methyl esters are otherwise known as biodiesel and can be used in cars to, in the combustion engine. So we've seen sodium hydroxide, we go with soap. If we use fats and oils instead with methanol with potassium hydroxide catalyst, we end up going to form biodiesel. These are the two key reactions that we see with the esters. So in summary then, you should be able to apply the IUPAC rules for naming carboxylic acids and esters. Describe the reactions of carboxylic acids with carbonates. Recall and give the conditions for esterification reactions. And describe hydrolysis reactions and the saponification and formation of biodiesel. That's all for now. I'll see you next time.